Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today it's with great pleasure to host Professor Michel Campos. Michel Campos is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and History at Penn State. He's the author of the acclaimed book, Ottoman Brothers, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Early 20th Century Palestine, which is already a classic. And more importantly for us here at Jerusalem Unplugged, she's the author of a groundbreaking article and work on late Ottoman Jerusalem, published by Comparative Studies in Society and History, Mapping Urban Mixing and Intercommunal Relations in Late Ottoman Jerusalem, which I can simply translate as uh, the first GIS work mapping the old city of Jerusalem. Michelle, welcome. Thank you very much, Roberto. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, as usual, the first question is, Michelle, what is your Jerusalem? In other words, what is your connection with the city? So my Jerusalem, um, you know, it's both a kind of, well, I think it's it's multiple Jerusalems as it is perhaps for many people and as many cities are for many people, right? I mean, it's, uh, of course, the Jerusalem that you hear about growing up in America, which is very much dictated by, you know, religious, spiritual, kind of metaphysical, kind of the 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 holy Jerusalem, right? The holy city for those who are raised in monotheistic religious tradition. So I was very much familiar with that Jerusalem. Um, And then when I graduated from from university, I went to the terrestrial Jerusalem (laughs) for the first time uh, to study at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And so this is where all of my book learning in college, as well as, you know, my biblical exposure um, growing up, came together and I saw a very different Jerusalem, right? The Jerusalem of not only the the holy sites and um, sort of the religious, spiritual, metaphysical, you know, feelings and values that people have about the city, but actual people living there, working there, struggling uh, in daily life. And so for me, that was really um, this eye-opening moment. This was the summer of 1993. Uh, so you'll remember this was only a few months before the Oslo Accords became public, right? Uh, and so I met that whole summer and the beginning of that whole year was really trying to come to terms with the Jerusalem that I had studied about in, studied in, in college uh, and the Jerusalem that I saw, which was not just a Jewish Israeli Zionist city, but also a city which was inhabited by you know, 30% Palestinians. Uh, which had important Islamic monuments dating back hundreds of years, you know, 1400 years. Um, And that, of course, was much less emphasized both in the coursework that I had taken as well as in this popular narrative in America. So for me, it was really an eye-opening moment to reconcile the real Jerusalem, the lived Jerusalem um, of Jerusalemites and not just this kind of fantasy Jerusalem of the Western or the American or the Christian Uh, or the Zionist imagination. Um, So that would, I think, part of what I have done since that time period is really to try to get more, you know, deeper to understanding what the historical Jerusalem was, to go beyond this, you know, this sense of the city as being this untouchable or this timeless city, and and to really think about the city as a, as a neighborhood or a series of neighborhoods, as a place where people you know, are born and work and study and love and die and fight. And, um, you know, I think, think, you know, in the vastness of the human experience that took place in the city, which I have felt and to a certain extent still feel today that the historical and certainly the popular narratives of the city do not come close to really covering um, the multiple types of populations that have lived there from different religious, linguistic, ethnic, national professional, occupational uh, groups, um, as well as uh, the different meanings that they have had and the ways in which, you know, the Jerusalemites, people who live in the city uh, on a daily basis have struggled within it, um, are experiencing global changes. So 
I think Jerusalem for me is is this balance between kind of the book Jerusalem and the real Jerusalem, the lived Jerusalem um, that I'm trying to go back and forth between. I'm curious about something because you have become, in your work, become some sort of uh, this uh, beacon for those who want to know more about uh, late Ottoman Jerusalem. So how did you transition from just studying Jerusalem, being interested in the city, into the specific uh, period of time that you've been working on? So the late Ottoman part is actually really accidental. <laughs> um, I was at that point in graduate school and, um, you know, as many graduate students trying to, look, trying to look for a dissertation topic, I was drawn to thinking about the kinds of sources that I would look at, you know, Many graduate students will recognize that we're told to look for original sources that nobody else has used or, you know, as, as an entree into a, a question that perhaps hasn't been, been asked or as an entree to, you know, a, a new source for a, a different kind of answer, maybe to, perhaps to some of these familiar questions, but a new answer driven by new sources. So I came across um, a series of newspapers written in Ladino uh, and in Jerusalem in the late Ottoman period, so right before World War I. Um, at the Ben Svi Institute in Jerusalem one summer when I was doing pre-dissertation research. And I was struck by them because, you know, I had been studying Hebrew at that point for several years, as well as Arabic. Um, but here I see a newspaper written in Hebrew characters, but it wasn't Hebrew. And I was struggling to try to understand what, what it was until it dawned on me that this was Spanish. And Spanish was my first language growing up. And so for me, it became this really fascinating opportunity to look at, you know, obviously this is a newspaper published by the Sephardi community, uh, primarily for the Sephardi community, the Judeo-Spanish reading uh, community in Jerusalem at the time. And for me, it was really an entree into a subset of Jerusalem society that I hadn't thought about before um, through the language, this language that sounded very familiar in many ways, very strange in many ways because of all of the Turkish and French and Italian words that are in Ladino as well as <laughs> the Spanish and Hebrew words, of course, um, and to as well as the content of what was being written about in this newspaper was very strange. It was not what I was anticipating based on the then dominant uh, history books uh, in the field. So, for example, you know, they were talking about the um, Ottoman Revolution and they were talking about their hopes and dreams for the Ottoman Empire and they were talking about their neighbors in Jerusalem and in Palestine, you know, the Muslims and, and other Arabs, um, in a way that was not discussed in the secondary scholarship. And so for me, it really raised a lot of really interesting questions about, wait, what did this empire mean to this subset of the population? Because we had been taught, I'm sure you also grew up in this historiographic tradition, right, that this was, there was an inherently antagonistic relationship between the Ottoman state or the Turks, as they were, you know, homogenized as, and all of their subject populations, so including Jews and Arabs and, and others, wherever you are in the empire. And so to hear in this Judeo-Spanish newspaper, to hear these, you know, laudatory articles praising revolution, praising the kind of ideals of the revolution, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity, but also wrestling with what that meant for Jews, particularly Sephardic Jews in Palestine at that time, uh, was something that I had not anticipated and was really this moment for me to um, unwittingly, I think, challenge the existing scholarship, um, but to really continue to ask a series of questions about what did empire mean? What did belonging mean? Uh, what was the experience of living in an empire for a religious, ethnic, linguistic minority in a faraway province, um, which was not what it had been, what, what it be, we had been taught to understand it as. So it's entirely accidental, <laughs> short answer. Well, in talking, by, uh, talking about accidents, uh, I think it's nice to share this, uh, this episode, but uh, I and Michelle met at the Ottoman Archives in 2004 totally accidentally, and I remember clearly the moment I was uh, uh, doing my research for my PhD, and I was asking for some material related to, I think it was about prisons in Jerusalem during the period of World War I, and I remember this, uh, this man looked at me and said, yo, I mean, it's like, no, it's not, it's not available. I'm like, wait a second, what does it mean? I mean, who's, who's sitting here? 
ordering the same stuff I'm actually ordering and, and that where we eventually met. So, uh, and I must say that it was very much accidental for me too. Sorry, can I stop you for just a second to respond to that? Um, I, of course, remember that clearly. And it was, you know, one of those moments of serendipity in the archives when you meet someone that is become, you know, obviously someone whose work I respect and learn a lot from. So I was delighted about that. But I also want to say that to this day, I have not used those documents on prisons in Jerusalem. And I keep thinking about going back to them. You know, I have this vision of, a, of an article, at least, Crime and Punishment in Late Autumn in Jerusalem. So I may yet revive those. I don't know if you have used them. I haven't seen um, any articles if you have used them. But it's, it's funny that that's, those, that's the set of documents you remember, because I, I distinctly remember reading them and thinking, this is fascinating, but having to put them aside for now, it's what, 15 years. <laughs> and I must share that I never used them too. I was trying to find something <laughs> about uh, prisoners uh, who they might have been. And, and then I remember reading some records about some women, about some men, petty crime, prostitution, but uh, I never use them. And so, yes, we're still uh, somewhere. Uh, and, you know, that back in back in those days, I, I don't remember taking pictures. It was just photocopy. So actually I have a physical photocopy of a document sitting somewhere uh, in my office. But I wanted to ask you something about historiography and not just an academic level. It's true what you mentioned that essentially for decades, the way the history of Jerusalem, the history of Palestine in general, was portrayed around that period of time was that the Ottomans controlled the city. Uh, they were inherently neglecting the city. They didn't provide services. Arabs, Jews, uh, locals essentially criticized the Ottomans. And that's the end of it. And the British arrived. That's the beginning of modern Jerusalem. Now, through the work of many, that narrative had been challenged. But it's interesting that sometimes I still pick that kind of uh, narrative, particularly in history books in Israel, but also in the Western world, where still it's very hard to show the nuances and actually embed Jerusalem, as many other territories, within the Ottoman Empire and be part of the Ottoman Empire. There's still this idea that, well, it must have been the British and the French that really changed the face of the Middle East. So I was wondering, what do you think of these narratives? How do you think we can change them? And not just at the academic level, but also at you know primary, secondary education, where really kids learned about this history. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, the most obvious answer, of course, is the fact that Ottoman language, as you know, is difficult <laughs> to study and learn and read and use. And so... The reason why I think this narrative continues um, is because so few scholars are using Ottoman sources. You know, so if we think about the gold mine that um, Yasmin Afja and Felestine Naili and uh, Vincent Lemire brought by translating and collating and translating the minutes of the Jerusalem municipality from the 1890s to the 1900s, early 1900s. Before then, of course, what did we have? We had an article by Ruth Kark that said the Jerusalem municipality existed. We don't really know what it did, didn't really do much. At the same time, that is contextualized next to all of the other work of historical geographers, Kark included, who argued that the city was really built and modernized and expanded by others, not the Ottoman state. So now we see, thanks to these municipal minutes, that in fact, the Ottoman state and the municipality were very robust institutions that did a lot from, you know, paving streets and repairing, uh, installing and repairing sewage systems to all kinds of other things about municipal governance, including how they treated the different populations living in the city. Um, so I think that until we find we have more of these kinds of primary sources written from the Ottoman perspective, and of course, the municipal minutes are written from perspective, not of the Ottoman central state, but local representatives, right? So these are Ottoman citizens serving in an Ottoman institution, writing in the Ottoman language, in addition to some Arabic entries, but many Ottoman language entries. Um, I think until we get more of those translated or incorporated into the existing scholarship, um, it becomes too easy to ignore the Ottoman side of things because we don't see and hear what they've been doing in the city. I think that's an important first beginning. 
Uh, so just, I can't remember what work it is. I was just reading recently a, another more popular work, I think, on the on Jerusalem. And it also replicated this narrative of the city of, you know, kind of decaying Ottoman Empire in which they neglected it and nothing happened uh, until the British arrived. And, and this was a very recently published work. And I was surprised and not surprised to find the city represented that way. Moving to your work, I think one of the most uh, uh, problematic stereotypes that it survived um, is about the uh, segregation of Jerusalem. In general, you hear the story that obviously Jerusalem is divided today, but it was divided even before. And so, particularly looking at the uh, old city of Jerusalem, of course, you have a Christian quarter, a Muslim quarter, a Jewish quarter, an Armenian quarter, suggesting that people really didn't mix with each other. Now, we know that is not true, but in your latest article, you prove that not only with documents, but also using modern technology, mapping where people actually lived. And so I was wondering if you can actually tell us how you, first of all, how you came to use maps, GIS, to what extent is actually useful, and what, you know, an analysis of uh, Jerusalem in particular, but of cities in general, can help us to understand about cities and how they work. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I came to this current project really based on some of the gaps that emerged in my understanding of the city from my first book. So um, one of the, you know, obviously I, the, the book, the first book in general, Ottoman Brothers, was about the uh, impact of the 1908 Ottoman Revolution on Muslims, Christians, and Jews at the time. There was one chapter in particular that looked at the city of Jerusalem, um, the work of, to some extent, the city council, but primarily the Chamber of Commerce and other, uh, you know, urban business elite uh, and community leaders to modernize the city, to, you know, bring running water, electricity, tramways, those kinds of things. But what I realized in the course of that was that I didn't really understand much about the city beyond that. I, I wanted to understand, you know, where people lived, how they lived. You know, we have a lot on the historical geography in general. So what buildings were built when, right? Um, but we have, I felt that there was not enough that enabled me to really feel the city, to walk through the city as I was reading these, you know, newspaper sources, for example, or others, you know, memoirs that do that to a certain extent. And of course, I'm thinking of the wonderful memoir uh, by Wasif Jauharia, and I know you've interviewed Salim Tamari and <coughs> Isam Nassar. Um, and so that's a fantastic memoir. There are, you know, a few others in Arabic and in Hebrew um, that do give us a little bit of a lived sense of the city. Uh, but I still felt that, that I didn't understand enough about the structure of the city, um, about, again, where people lived, where people went to work, you know, what the connections were between these different neighborhoods. And, and it popped up here and there in the sources that I had used for the first book. So, you know, looking at, for example, in newspapers, they would publish lists of men between, you know, the ages of 19 and 24 who had been called up to come to um, the military inspection committee and they would publish their names in the neighborhoods they lived in. Um, so that was one small area in which I was able to get a sense of like, oh, these are people that are connected to a certain part of the city. So it was really trying to, to fill that gap that led me to really to embark on this new project, which is to write a social history of late Ottoman Jerusalem. And it began with the Ottoman census that I had seen and used a tiny bit in the first project, but really began to use much more intensively for this project um, as a way to try to understand who the Jerusalemites were, right? And I talked earlier about what is my Jerusalem. It was sort of trying to bridge the gap between the paper Jerusalem and the actual Jerusalem I was walking through with the people I was encountering. Um, so I felt that the people of historical Jerusalem were still very much um, other than the elite who left records very much an unknown quantity. And so it was fascinating for me to read these Ottoman notebooks of the census records and to see, you know, the hamamji, so somebody who works in the public bath, the bathhouse attendant, or the hamal, the porter, or, you know, the see someone is referred to as the convert, or these other, you know, very ordinary Jerusalemites who didn't appear in any other history book, who didn't leave any written record, um, to all of a sudden see them in the pages of these notebooks and moreover, to see them attached to particular streets 
and even particular buildings in the city. So it began as a way of really trying to place people in the city. And what I noticed very early on that it was, you know, even the way that the Ottoman structured these census notebooks, it was uh, meant to obscure the mixing of the city, right? So that they separated people into notebooks, not only based on neighborhood, but even within that based on their millet. So you would you could have in one neighborhood, and I think I mentioned this in an article, you know, one neighborhood, you would have to look for eight, you look in eight different notebooks to try to figure out who lived in that neighborhood. And so it's really, for me, it was a lot of piecing together uh, and erasing these lines of separation that existed bureaucratically and certainly, you know, in our popular imagination today, these lines of separation and to place them back in the same physical space. Um, and so simultaneous to reading through the census records and transcribing them and, and thinking about that, I was reading a lot about the digital humanities and GIS work and um, thinking a lot about some of the more theoretical uh, cultural, cultural geography works about space and place. Um, and so it was really, you know, this article that you referenced is really the kind of the pilot study for me to see what could come out of this. And one of the one of the challenges in the digital, digital humanities um, is that uh, I think it's even hard for humanists and the tech people who are the people with the technical knowledge to have the same conversation. So a few years ago, um, I did a an institute. It was a summer institute at the um, I'm going to butcher the name because I can't remember right offhand, but it was uh, run by Duke University, the digital humanities lab um, and in Venice. And uh, so it was it was Venice International University, I think Is that that's an, a university, right? You'll remember. <laughs> I don't remember, but I know there are plenty of international institutions in Venice. So okay. it's possible. I have it written down somewhere and I'm just blanking right now. But at any rate, it was a, a, an institute that was meant to basically train humanists, historians, art historians, archaeologists and others uh, to begin to have these kinds of conversations and collaborations with uh, people in the digital side of things. And so that was my first exposure to my first, you know, I think introduction to using GIS uh, myself, but also it gave me some tools to come back to my then institution to talk with, with people there about uh, how can I use this perhaps to think through um, remapping Jerusalem, a city that didn't, you know, that looks very different today, obviously, with a population that has changed entirely. So for me, you know, as I mentioned, it was really a pilot study because I wasn't sure that it would be useful. You know, the first conversations that I had with GIS specialists, they didn't understand what I was even asking. Um, and I didn't know enough about GIS to know what I was asking or if it was possible um, to do what I wanted to do. And so it was, you know, it took a long time to, again, of reading the scholarship on GIS, of reading uh, studies um, using GIS to figure out, you know, what I might be able to do. And uh, the question of, is it useful? I think for me, it was very eye-opening to see mapped out, you know, to see the city mapped out and the population mapped out in a way that I had kind of hypothesized or intuited might be, but then to see it actually, you know, empirically play out was very eye-opening. But I will say that it was a tremendous amount of time and effort. And uh, this is kind of the trade off, right? I don't know if it's necessarily worth it for everybody to do this. It's, you know, a number of people have over the years talked to me about doing digital humanities projects or GIS projects. And, and uh, you know, I don't know that I'm far enough away from this to be able to, and certainly I'm not the authority on this, uh, to be able to say whether or not it's worth it for everybody to do that. For me personally, it gave me an insight onto historical Jerusalem that I don't think I could have grasped any other way. Um, and it's continued to open entire, you know, new sets of questions for me about the historical city. So for me, it's worth it. But, it, you know, certainly with the acknowledgement that it, it was a tremendous amount of investment of time and effort. When I was looking at the maps in the article, I was fascinated by by the fact that obviously the neighborhoods, the quarters, better saying, were mixed. But more importantly, from you know detailed mapping that you have produced, you get to see that nevertheless, at a street level, 
or even at a building level. On the other hand, you find more homogeneity. So it looks like neighborhoods are mixed. But then when you go to even a more micro level, uh, the single streets or the buildings, you actually get to see like homogeneity. So that actually communities are coming together based on, I guess, their own identity, religion, or, or so forth. My question is that, what do we learn more about Jerusalem looking at these maps? So, I think for me, it's also important to bring in this, this um, that this is a, a moment to reconsider the earlier narrative, where we talked about this historiographic, almost, you know, certainty that Jerusalem was divided, that, you know, the empire was decayed and neglectful and all of that. Um, but in, I would say that in the last decade, perhaps there's been a swing with the pendulum almost to the other direction uh, in which we have these wonderful sources that do talk about the city as being mixed. You know, they, they either erase or downplay the kind of social and certainly physical boundaries uh, between members of different communities in the city. Um, but I wonder and I have wondered whether or not this might be bordering on this nostalgia for an earlier period, you know, connected to this broader Ottoman nostalgia or this, uh, I think, maybe even a, a, an unnuanced perspective of, you know, cosmopolitanism. It's unproblematic. Everybody, you know, it's a very diverse city. People are mixing and they're, and, and I feel like there's, um, for me, this was also a way of tempering that. And, you know, I have been accused of being perhaps a, a neo-Ottomanist in my first work or being, you know, too nostalgic or too idealistic about um, this, you know, Ottoman Brotherhood, um, even though I feel like that wasn't the case. You know, half of my book is about the challenges and problems. But nonetheless, uh, I think, it's, you know, it's likewise thinking about these mixed Ottoman cities or there's heterogeneous Ottoman cities that for me, it's been a way to balance between the two. And, and, and what you've identified is part of that process, right, of looking at, you know, if we zoom to the neighborhood level, right? Then it looks like it's very heterogeneous, very mixed. We have Muslims, we have Christians, we have Jews, we have Greek Orthodox, we have Armenians, we have, you know, the North African Jews and Eastern European Jews and, you know, the old Spanish, you know, Sephardic Jews. Um, and so it looks like, you know, as well, we have Muslims from India and from Iran and from, you know, the Sudan. So it looks very mixed. But th then, of course, what you talked about and what you identified was that when we zoom in to different, different levels, then we do see different patterns that, that emerge. And so for me, what became interesting was not just thinking about the fact of mixing, but this process. Why was it, you know, to what extent was it mixed, right? Why was it, why did that kind of mixing emerge the way that it did at the time that it did? And then to try to think about, you know, was that transient? Was that not, you know, to what extent is that representative of the structure of the city? Because the article you're referring to is very much looking at one neighborhood, right? Is this, as I mentioned, this pilot or the microcosm to see if this GIS thing would even work. Um, and so obviously if we zoomed out to the scale of the whole city, then the, the picture changes somewhat because you already have very homogeneous neighborhoods and compounds and areas of the city that have emerged, that had emerged by the turn of the 20th century. Um, so it, th that level of mixing was not representative of the whole city, right? It's very different. Um, and so thinking about these patterns, these very different patterns of segregation on the building level where you, you have, you know, you wouldn't even have Catholics and Greek Orthodox living in the same building. Uh, again, in this pilot neighborhood, this is not to say that they never lived in the same building anywhere else, but certainly in this pilot neighborhood, we did not see them doing that to the street level where you could have, you know, very homogeneous or very heterogeneous streets to the neighborhood level. I mean, what I, I what I found is that you really do have to incorporate other kinds of sources, right? The census, as you know, scholars, the census will tell you is one snapshot in a moment in time in the city, right? It doesn't tell us, you know, who lived there the day before, who lived where the day after the census. It certainly doesn't explain why people lived where they lived at the time that the census was taken. So what I tried to do in this article as well and in, in the Bigger Book Project is to think through some of the other sources and some of the other ways that we might understand how these patterns emerge. So, you know, legal, um, you know, the legal definitions of certain kinds of buildings and uh, the ways in which the rental market operated in the city, for example, um, are obviously important parts of that picture as well.
in light of uh, similar works, particularly done in the Irish context, where Irish uh, scholars have looked at cities and obviously the intermixing of Catholics and, and Protestants, um, they also ended up looking into the question of mixed marriages and looking at a neighborhood level, you know, the, the marriage patterns and see whether there were in fact mixed marriages or not. And I wonder if it may be a possibility one day to find out even a, not just about the buildings, but also about the relations that these neighbors had with each other. If they went just beyond uh, living in the same street, sharing the same neighborhood, or actually they they had different kind of relations, you know, even going down to, uh, uh, you know, mixed marriages or marriages, you know, between the various families living in the same compound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this was a really fascinating um, and promising direction. And I'm certainly thinking about this in some, and beginning to do this research in some direction. So looking at right now, I've been looking at with the help of a research assistant, um, the Sharia court records in Jerusalem to try to get a sense of what kind of relationships, what kind of contacts did people have, uh, but also to get more of a sense of the socioeconomic background of the population, because the census doesn't tell you everything, right? It tells you where people lived, it tells you perhaps the occupation, it tells you, you know, family construct, but it doesn't give you, um, you know, details of their actual lives like the court registers would do. So that's certainly one avenue that I've begun to explore. Um, but what you're talking about, I mean, I think is really interesting when, when we think about the uh, literature on social networks, right? They talk about um, strong ties versus weak ties. And so one of the questions that I still have is, you know, on the one hand, I make the argument in this article that proximity matters, right? That even if they're not living, even if they're in separate, you know, segregated buildings, they pass each other on the street every day. And that matters to a certain extent. Um, but what I'm still trying to figure out, you know, is that, so, you know, it could be a weak tie or it could be, you know, a, a stronger way of looking at the urban landscape overall, you know, that, that con, you know, contact theorists will argue that being in contact with, being exposed to different people changes how you think about them, how you interact with them, what opportunities are open to you, that kind of thing. You know, certainly there are lots of other ways to interrogate this. Um, there are not, unfortunately, going to be a lot of mixed marriages, although you do encounter some. I mean, certainly we've encountered some in the, in the census records um, where you'll see, you know, somebody referred to as a convert, uh, and then later they'll show up in the next census that they've married into a certain family. Uh, or occasionally you'll have someone who retains their separate religion married into the family, although you can tell by the name, for example, you know, that this person must have come from a Jewish family, they have a very Jewish name, but yet they're listed as being Greek Orthodox because they've married into this Greek Orthodox family. That's rare, but you do find it. Um, but I think that there have to be other ways to look for the kind of social relationships that people had, you know, whether it be, as I mentioned, through the court records um, or through some of the memoir narratives. Um, but part of the challenge is how do you find those very quotidian relationships? How do you find evidence of that? Uh, most people don't leave. You know, think about today, like, what do you write about in your diary if you write a diary? You don't talk about everybody that you encountered on your walk or in the grocery store or, you know, who you emailed with that day or who you talked to on the phone that day necessarily. And so trying to think about um, to what extent neighboring, and, and this is a whole other literature, you know, this literature about neighboring, um, whether it be neighboring or who you encounter on the streets, to what extent that's a strong tie or a weak tie, to what extent it was um, overlapping with other kinds of contacts. So, you know, are you going to be more likely to be a business partner with somebody that who lives down, you know, who lives down the street from you or not? Uh, I think that's the kind of thing that takes really multiple kinds of sources, multiple kinds of methods um, to overlay and to try to figure that out. We are going to take a short break. Thank you for listening. And remember to join our Facebook page, Twitter and Instagram account. If you have a story about Jerusalem that you want to share or someone that you want me to interview, please get in touch. Enjoy the rest of the show. I have one question about technology. You obviously worked on GIS. Uh, there's been a number of projects recently working on different aspects of Jerusalem, rely on different kinds of technologies. Uh, Jerusalem, we are here essentially mapped 
uh, Katamon, and so you now can access Google Maps and uh, basically travel through through history and uh, get a sense who lived in Katamon during the British uh, mandate. Another project uh, looks at um, rebuilding uh, the Maghrebi Quarter, which was demolished in 1967, relying on some sort of uh, digital technology and relying on the records uh, of the past so to rebuild virtually uh, these neighborhoods. Do you think technology can help us to better understand uh, uh, the history of Jerusalem and the relationship between people? Yeah, I think absolutely. Um... In terms of Jerusalem, we are here. You know, I taught a class on Jerusalem a few years ago at my previous institution, and the students, um, actually, I think in this class it was for the Israeli Palestinian conflict, uh, in which they looked at it, and students were really engrossed by this. I mean, because as you as you mentioned, you know, they can, you know, there are both historical maps overlaid with contemporary satellite imagery, and then you have some narratives, and they walk you through video tours, uh, following particular, you know, residents' life stories in the neighborhood. Um, so I think that that's one very visceral way that people can feel the city as a lived environment and not just as this kind of mythical name or not just, you know, a word in a text, uh, but they can bring together some of the experiences of Jerusalemites with some of the visual uh, remnants or material cultural uh, remnants of the city, as well as the experiential, if you, think, you know, thinking about perhaps virtual reality and how do you go on a VR tour of Jerusalem. Um, so I'll just mention this because it's kind of funny to me, but uh, I was having conversations with some of the uh, digital human humanities folks in my previous institution a few years ago because I've been thinking about doing this, uh, a, a much larger digital humanities project um, to go along with the book. And one of them mentioned to me uh, the Assassin's Creed video game. I don't know if you've seen it before. I had not been exposed to that. My kids are too young to play Assassin's Creed, thankfully, but I did look at some of the YouTube videos of it. And, you know, in some ways, obviously it's this very Orientalist uh, picture of Jerusalem, you know, as, as an Islamic city or probably like the Crusader period. And so it has all of those problematic overlays of political, religious, civilizational kind of flattening discourses. But at the same time, it's kind of engrossing. You're wandering, you know, jumping, actually jumping from rooftop to rooftop, walking through uh, the alleys of the city. And I think that there, you know, that that for people, particularly for students or for people who have not been able to travel to Jerusalem or to other parts of the world, being able to experience or to visualize the city in a different way is really, really powerful. So I look also at other kinds of digital urban history projects um, that are out there that have been really interesting to me to think through. So the Digital Harlem Project, for example, uh, looks at crime reports uh, in the Harlem neighborhood in a certain you know, period of time, I think early 20th century. And these are all really fascinating ways of linking you know, the bread and butter of historians, which is like archival texts, right? Which might be very dry and on their own don't mean anything. Uh, but then putting them in a certain landscape, bringing people's, you know, historical figures, their life stories, their experiences, and connecting them with those texts would be really powerful. So, for example, thinking back to our Ottoman, <laughs> our Ottoman archive days of the prison charts, right? I mean, if, if I'm remembering correctly, these are like tables listing uh, the people who have been arrested, the crimes they were arrested for, you know, that, that sort of thing, which is very dry on the one hand. But then if we were to link that to a map of the prison in Jerusalem, uh, to perhaps the census information of those prisoners, to some of the information, you know, well, this crime of, you know, what did this crime mean, actually, you know, theft in a market, you know, how do we understand the amount that they were charged with? What does this mean that, you know, for the livelihood of that prisoner or in, you know, the life of a normal Jerusalem? I, I think that becomes much more meaningful than perhaps it just being a footnote in a text of like, there were, you know, 16 arrests in Jerusalem in the month of August 1907. So I think there's a lot of potential, right, for technology to play a really almost revolutionary role in understanding, visualizing, and experiencing, you know, historical narratives. Um, but it's a huge amount of investment. I can only imagine. And uh, it also requires a passion and understanding of technology, which not necessarily everybody has. Uh, and I must admit, at a personal level, my own limits, even understanding GIS. I appreciate the product. I just don't know how it works, but that's another story. 
you mentioned historical figures. And before we move to another issue that I want to discuss with you, and I want to link uh, and ask you about one particular historical figure. I'm personally fascinated with a woman, and I've been researching her for now a decade, and I finally managed to put together a few things. Uh, Leah Tenenbaum, who was a woman living uh, in late Ottoman Jerusalem. Uh, she was not only the uh, mistress of Jamal Pasha during World War I, but she happened to work also with uh, a famous character in the city, and that was uh, Albert Antebi. And you wrote about Albert Antebi. Antebi was this uh, sort of a Ottoman individual. He was Jewish. He spoke multiple languages. And I always been been fascinated by him. And despite the fact not much has been written, in fact, you are the only one who consistently sort of uh, used his material, records, and his figure amongst the uh, different parts of Jerusalem society. And I was wondering, since many others talked about historical figures, if you can tell us something about Albert Antebi. Yeah, thanks. Um, Antebi is a, a fascinating figure, but I should note that, in fact, there was a book in French published by, I think, his granddaughter, Elizabeth Antebi, uh, about him. And she also has digitized a lot of sources um, letters and other things from him. So there is there's a corpus um, which has not been incorporated so much into uh, the English language scholarship, um, but that's a fascinating source on its own, um, as well as uh, Mikhail Laskiel wrote a few articles about him um, as well. But so Antebi, you know, as you rightly mentioned, is, is this really fascinating, you know, polyglot figure. He was the director of the, the vocational school of the Alliance Israelite Universelle in Jerusalem. Um, he was a quite polarizing figure. Uh, you know, certain people in Jerusalem absolutely hated his guts. So if we think about, you know, um, Eliezer ben Yehuda and his son Itamar ben Avi. They're constantly publishing against him. They call him a little Caesar, a tyrant. Um, you know, he they you know they derided what they called you know, his Oriental characteristics. You know, he was authoritarian. Um, he, he, he was very much about kind of greasing the wheels, uh, but he had very good connections with the various Ottoman governors uh, who came through Jerusalem. He did fashion himself as uh, the unelected and unofficial you know, leader of the Jewish community, even though there obviously there were rabbinical leaders and others who were elected um, who had a more official role. But he nonetheless, you know, certainly concerned himself with affairs uh, relating to the Jewish community. and was called upon, both called upon himself as well as was called upon repeatedly to intervene with Ottoman officials at various moments in time. So um, even until the end of his life, which he ended up dying uh, in exile during World War I, even right before he was expelled from Palestine, he was intervening on behalf of other Jews who had been imprisoned by Jamal Pasha. So, you know, he's a really fascinating figure because he did see himself uh, very much as being indigenous to the Ottoman Empire, is being loyal to the Ottoman Empire. So, you know, after the 1908 revolution, um, he's very much enthralled with and committed to the Ottomanist program, right? He's a member of the empire. The empire is reforming itself. You know, he is going to operate within the constructs of this changing empire and try to help it change for the better. You know, he was an active official in the Chamber of Commerce and in other urban institutions he was a failed candidate for parliament and for the um, administrative council. Uh, so he he didn't have, um, he had, a, I think, a lot of this unofficial uh, wusta or kind of this power, right, influence in the city. But he was not able to translate that into votes because he did have a lot of enemies, particularly within the Jewish community, but also to some extent within the Palestinian community who resented his um, what they saw as kind of dual loyalties um, by uh, speaking out or even acting for the benefit of some of the Zionist colonies and for the Zionist movement, even though ideologically he was very much opposed to Zionism and explicitly wrote uh, that it would endanger the status of Ottoman Jews like him in, as individuals, but more importantly as a community in the Ottoman Empire to be identified with a European movement that um, he saw as being nationalist, as being threatening to the Ottoman state. So you, you see these contradictions in him, like you see in many other both historical figures as well as contemporary figures, right? You know, very loyally Ottoman, but also 
you know, didn't hesitate to intervene to help out uh, Zionists who he thought were damaging the Ottoman Empire and his Ottomanist commitments, um, very much hated by people that he nonetheless made an effort to help defend and to intervene on behalf of. Um, but he's, you know, he was a really fascinating figure. I don't know his relationship with Leah Tannenbaum, so I'm, interesting to, I'm interested to hear more about your findings in that regard. But it, it's, I think she's not the only one who was rumored to have been uh, Jamal Pasha's mistress, right? I think there, there are several rumors. Well, she definitely was Jamal Pasha's mistress. And apparently what I found out is that she works somehow, some sort of a secretary for Albert Antebi. I, I'm not aware of any particular personal relationship between the two. I guess the age gap might have been a problem too, but uh, there was a connection. Uh, and I wonder also if she might have reported uh, uh, information from Jamal to Antebi, particularly during the period of the war, but but that I, I couldn't find out. Uh, she's a, a very uh, elusive figure. Uh, records are very scanty. It's all tried to piece together information from different sources. So it, it is a very interesting figure though. And uh, I happened to finally find out that she ended up in Canada, where she's buried, uh, under a different name. So she had a very, uh, I would say, diverse, intriguing, but also, I would say, like, complicated life, uh, which I hope one day to piece together. But this is just the personal satisfaction to find out about someone who was the object of many rumors in late Ottoman Jerusalem. I mean, uh, I found in many sources her name was central you know, in relation to Jamal Pasha. So obviously that, that's what uh, drove me. I want to move to another uh, issue as we move towards the end of the interview. You recently were part of a panel uh, discussing why Ottoman history of Palestine is important. And I just want to mention that uh, Ottoman history of Palestine and of Jerusalem had been neglected for decades, after, particularly after World War I. Uh, or it certainly took a negative turn, uh, and not many work on that. But in recent times, for different reasons, first, uh, the Turkish government, particularly under the current president, Erdogan, but also Israeli settlers revived uh, their sort of uh, understanding and interest in Ottoman history of Palestine and Jerusalem, obviously with very different uh, purposes. I was wondering, how do you relate to, to them? How do you think about this revival in both uh, Turkey, but also in Israel, particularly from the side of the, uh, of the settlers? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, it, it's really interesting to see the, the ways in which over the last 15 years, the Turkish government has invested so much in Palestinian institutions, scholarship about late Ottoman Palestine. I mean, there are a number of books um, and edited collections featuring not only, you know, documents from the Ottoman archives, but of course, the, also the inscriptions on buildings. Um, they're also contributing, of course, to the um, archive for the revival of Islamic heritage in Abu Dis, which is kind of an unofficial Palestinian national archive um, in lieu of an official existing one. Uh, and so, that's been really fascinating because they've provided a lot of tremendous support for, you know, Palestinian institutions on the ground that are doing a lot of this cultural heritage work. So, um, you know, the Ta'awun organization in Jerusalem has been carrying out renovations of, uh, I think, at least one, if not possibly two of the historical um, hammams, public baths uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Um, and they've also been publishing a lot of work about about the sort of built environment and the cultural heritage of Palestinian and Islamic Jerusalem that, of course, is being downplayed and ignored uh, by Israeli scholarship, but also by the Israeli government and the Jerusalem government itself. So they're, they're filling an important gap, I think, in, and providing um, some important resources for Palestinians as well as for scholarship about Palestine. Um, the flip side of that, as you mentioned, is the, the kind of settler movement. movement. Um, and I will say that the settler movement, or if you think about, um, they're not interested in Ottoman history of Jerusalem per se. You know, they could care less whether or not it's Ottoman or Mamluk or, you know, Venetian, right? It doesn't matter like what that period was, uh, who's, you know, who was ruling in the time 
of, of the 19th century, but they're more interested in recuperating kind of some kind of historicity to the city to buttress their legal and historical claims, right? So this is where the settler movement has been um, bringing either legal documents or certainly narratives about uh, Jews owning and or residing in particular houses, buildings, areas of the city as a way to lay claim to now uh, the settler movement um, as a movement, as well as individual settler initiatives to reoccupy those parts of the city. Um, so the narrative for them, you know, it's very, you know, they'll bring in kind of dates, they'll bring in this kind of pre-1948 past. Again, it doesn't matter if it was Ottoman or it could have been anything, um, but as a way of articulating that this is our heritage, this is our birthright to a certain extent, and here are the legal documents and the kind of physical precedent that justifies this move back to these areas. And so, you know, what they're what they're doing is very much both deeply historical, but also deeply ahistorical, right? Because it's it's the wrong kind of history. Because they're not, you know, they're they're less concerned about who it actually belonged to, and more concerned about about claiming that this was always used by Jews. And you know, certainly some of those uh, properties were either owned by or leased by Jews, but that's only part of the story. Right. What was the broader context of that and what is the broader context of what's happened to the city and those properties and the rights of use of the city in the intervening century? Plus, um, you know, that does not serve the settlers narrative and that doesn't serve their political and legal claims. So that gets left, left out of the picture. But it is interesting you know, to think about um, even more broadly beyond the settler movement. I mean, if you wander through Jerusalem and some of the 19th century Jewish neighborhoods, so like Ohel Moshe or Moskalat Moshe or some of those areas, you know, south of Agrippus, you know, the, the Machna Yehuda market, they'll have historical markers that the municipality has put up about, you know, these Jewish neighborhoods, you know, who built them, maybe, you know, some of the families that lived there. Um, and they're very much decontextualized, right? They can do that at the very same time that they ignore that this was under Ottoman administration, that there was a vibrant and very involved Ottoman local government, that there was a very involved urban government. Um, and so, you know, I think part of it is, is placing these very ahistorical narratives, individuals' claims in the recent past um, as a way, in a, in a certain way, I think of as erasing this 1948 marker. You made me think about the uh, Ottoman train station which in a sense, it's obviously Ottoman, but as you pointed out, when you start reading the various signs, there's something that doesn't feel right about contextualizing the, the, the train station within the city and what actually the train station meant for the local population. So, you know, certainly the arrival of pilgrims and tourists, but also the possibility to connect to other parts of Palestine, and that's completely gone and neglected. One last question about this particular topic here uh, before we, we move to the end. Where is Ottoman Jerusalem in 2021 Jerusalem? Is there an Ottoman Jerusalem that we can see and appreciate or is it completely hidden and neglected? That's a, an interesting question. Um, as you point out, you know, the, the first train station, I'm sure you've been there since it's what do they call it, beautification or <laughs> renovation, right? It's now become this kind of restaurant, both touristy, but also kind of like for secular Jerusalemites to go to on Saturdays. Um, and then the train, the former train tracks are these kind of pedestrian and physical fitness kind of enthusiast trail through part of the city. Um, but it can, you know, as you mentioned, very deeply decontextualized, right? And it, speaking of the first train station, if you look at, uh, the signs in their website, it's very much talking about the uh, concessionaire for the railway line, right? Yosef Be Navon, who was a Jewish Sephardic figure, um, and talking about, you know, the French and the British uh, financial support for it, but of course, leaving out the Ottoman context entirely. So we also, you know, think about uh, when I ride the light rail in Jerusalem today, I can't help but think back to the Ottoman plans for the light rail. Uh, back in uh, 1910, 1911, and 
for me, of course, this also highlights the stark differences between the two municipalities, the Ottoman municipality and the Israeli municipality, because uh, when there were first plans for and a kind of a tender issued for uh, a concession to build a light rail in Jerusalem in the 1910s, early 1910s, um, one of the proposals, and we know this from the archive of David Yellen, who was uh, a Jewish member of the uh, Jerusalem City Council at the time, he later becomes a member of the uh, Administrative Council, the Ottoman Administrative Council. His father was a member of the Jerusalem City Council as well. Um, but so in his personal archive, which is housed in the, the Central Zionist archives, there is um, a listing of the proposed stations for the light rail in Jerusalem. And it's fascinating because, you know, it's very much was thinking about who uses the city and to whom does the city belong. And so you have stations that would go to, you know, some of the, the villages outside of Jerusalem uh, or on the edge of Jerusalem. Uh, it would go to some of the religious sites where pilgrims are coming to. It would go to the commercial centers of the city. And there was no sense from that proposed light rail, you know, map that one, one part of the city is going to be neglected or one constituency of the city is going to be neglected over another. Of course, today's Jerusalem light rail is very different, right? You have Palestinian neighborhoods in the city that are completely left out. You know, the closest station is still quite a walk from Damascus Gate. You know, in the summer, it's not a pleasant walk. Um, and most of the other stop stations are all running through the Jewish part of the city, right? As well as even the bus lines uh, very much segregated and there was a whole alternative Palestinian bus line that came to fill in those gaps of the Palestinian neighborhoods and villages that the Egged bus line did not service uh, over the last <laughs> several decades after, you know, quote unquote unification of the city after 1967. So I think even when you have these kind of traces of the Ottoman city that was in the sense of the light rail or the traces of the Ottoman city that did not yet have time to become in the case of the light rail because it, it you know, was not built because of the war and, and you know, financial constraints and then of course the collapse of the empire and the arrival of the British. Um, even through those traces, we still see stark reminders of how different the city is and how different even the municipality views itself. What is its role, right? The fact that, that the Jerusalem municipality has been very active in the legal efforts of the settler movement as well as on its own to expropriate um, properties in which Palestinians live to um, and to legally hand them over to Jewish settlers as well as to limit uh, permits given to Palestinians to expand uh, their own neighborhoods or even their own houses, you know, carrying out house demolition, demolitions against those houses that have been illegally renovated or built. Um, very much, of course, sees itself as a city that serves the Jewish population and that serves the, um, you know, the Zionist definition of the state as a state and as a city and as a municipality for Jews alone. Um, so I think, that, you know, that for me is the most painful part of thinking about the Ottoman legacy that we are so far away from again, not to overly romanticize the Ottoman municipal you know, municipality or the Ottoman period in Jerusalem, but, you know, even with all of its problems, it was so much more a city of all of its residents and for all of its residents than today's Jerusalem has ever been since 1948, since 1967, whenever you start the count. And it's so far away from actualizing the demands, the needs, um, and the dreams of a giant portion of its population, and one third of the Palestinian population today <laughs> in Jerusalem that doesn't have any representation in the city council whose urban existence is being threatened by not only municipal, but also broader national uh, legislation, um, you know, in revoking their residency permits in Jerusalem and other things like that. So it's very much an ongoing struggle for them to remain in the city, in the land, in their homes. So, you know, I think that's that's the legacy of Ottoman Jerusalem, perhaps, that it was you know, destined not to actualize the potential of being the city for all of its residents. Um, how could it be a city for all of its residents when the state is not a state for all of its residents? Uh, if we think about the, the nation state law, most particularly, but also the, the very painful and violent events of May of this year, uh, in which we see that both on the urban levels 
uh, but also at the national level, these are still very contested and very fraught issues. And yet, at the very same time, you have this paradox where the Ottoman legacy is some, somewhat denied, but then uh, these groups rely on the very same Ottoman legacy, the documents through the TAPU registers, so through the cadastral records, to actually prove their own case. So they can't even escape this logic to recognize that there was an Ottoman Jerusalem and that could have taken different trajectories. Well, they're not using, I don't know what actual documents they're using because they've not been made public, but to my knowledge, um, they're not using the actual tabu res registers. They're using more kind of individual, you know, purchase contracts that they might have or lease contracts that, that they might have from individuals rather than from the institution. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right, ultimately. Well, ultimately, we still have to rely on uh, material produced in Ottoman Jerusalem. And, and as far as I'm aware, I mean, I, I know some people worked on that, why the Ottoman archives in Istanbul do not grant access to individuals looking for specific documents. But it's, it was done in the past. Some documents are available, but uh, it turns out to be inconclusive. I, I know Nazmi Jube and others have worked on this, and all of these documents don't prove anything. Uh, and then they've been taken from, uh, from the Ottoman archives. I, I think there is this question and issue that there is a looming Ottoman Jerusalem in modern uh, Ottoman history, which, which is there. I mean, and, and I think this is the way I see it. But as I said, it's, uh, it's only uh, in, in this case for supporting claims of one side over the others. I have one last question. You mentioned that the article you have written uh, is a pilot. So what's next? So I am working on um, this current book, tentatively titled <laughs> Unmixing the Holy City, because I kind of, I like that title for some reason. Um, but it, it looks more broadly at this 50 year period from the 1880s until the very beginning of the 1930s in which I think you have this transformation uh, of the city from a heterogeneous city, albeit with pockets of homogeneity, um, to a city that had become, at that point, quite significantly sectarianized. And one of the fascinating episodes that um, that launched me in, in this current book project was a few years ago when I came across the records of uh, what was called the Apartment Subcommittee, uh, which was you know this very obscure file in um, the Jer the Jerusalem Municipal Archives. Um, which, you know, as you know, the, sta the status of that archive has been deeply troubled for years and may, you know, be closed now. I'm not entirely sure what's happened in the last few months, but this is apropos what kind of documents do we have access to and what is the, the image of and our understanding of the city that emerges from that. And, you know, this is a big problem in terms of archival, archival transparency and access um, in Jerusalem as well as in Israel and historical Palestine more broadly. But so what the fascinating thing was about this apartment subcommittee, which was uh, taking place in the 1920s, was that they um, had actually come. This was a, a subcommittee of the Jewish Community Council in Jerusalem, and they had taken it upon themselves to survey where Jews were living in British Jerusalem uh, in the city at the time. Um, they were particularly alarmed by and concerned about those Jews who were living in mixed neighborhoods and what they called Arab houses. So. They weren't living in the more homogeneous Jewish neighborhoods that had emerged. They were living in some of these mixed neighborhoods, whether they be, you know, Talbia or the Ethiopian um, quarter or Musrara or, you know, kind of the ring, the first ring around uh, the old city that tended to be these mixed neighborhoods. Um, and they saw a lot of problems with this. And uh, so it was fascinating for me to read the survey where they went knocking door to door in these neighborhoods to ask the Jewish inhabitants you know, who are you? Why are you living here? And what will it take to get you to move out? Um, and so it was this moment of really attempting to nationalize the landscape of Jerusalem that obviously isn't born overnight. The 1920s are not disconnected from what comes before. Um, and this is also one of the things that I think the book is showing is that the, sort of the nationalist ideology of, of separation was only one of the aspects that contributed to Jerusalem looking the way that it looked, right? So you have also, as you know very well, British colonial policy that supported the separation. So another important chapter or, or aspect of this in the 1920s is a, a Jewish political organization called The Resident uh, that very much wanted to separate 
uh, the Jewish neighborhoods and established their own municipality. And they, they brought the precedent of Tel Aviv separating from Jaffa uh, as you know, their justification. Um, they were unsuccessful at the time. But so you have, you know, various elements as well as, you know, the, the more prosaic kind of legal and economic um, and religious elements from the earlier Ottoman period. So it's really this overlapping of those different elements um, that I'm looking at in the book and the longer process and multifaceted process by which um, Jerusalem, again, even in the Ottoman time, is uh, not just this cosmopolitan melting pot, right? Uh, I wouldn't even call it that, but I think that that, that is part of, of trying to get to a better understanding of what it means to be a mixed city in the late Ottoman imperial period. Uh, what did urban mixing look like? What did that mean? Um, going back to some of our earlier conversations about you know, kind of uh, the strong ties versus weak ties um, and what kind of relationships on the urban landscape people actually had. So that's this project. Um, and actually my, my next project is something that uh, you also mentioned um, in terms of you asked about intermarriages or, or you mentioned mixed marriages uh, in the Irish case. And that was something that I've been very interested in. So five years ago, I think when it, a few years ago, the last time I was able to go to um, the Ottoman archives in Istanbul, I collected uh, dozens of documents about um, conversion and intermarriage across the Ottoman landscape. I'm hopeful that this next project will be much more of an imperial, trans-imperial project um, to get away from Jerusalem for a tiny bit, or at least to, to put one foot outside of Jerusalem. Um, I probably will never be able to leave it permanently, but I, I am itching to to do a little bit more comparative work to look at other quarters of the of the empire. Um, so that's I mean ultimately what links all of my projects and all of my historical questions together is is really my abiding curiosity about intercommunal relations and what that looked like, whether it be in the lived urban landscape or in the more intimate family setting that I, I hope to do in the next project. This was Michelle Campos. Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and History at Penn State, and also the last guest of the first season of Jerusalem Unplugged. Michelle, thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Jerusalem Unplugged. This podcast is currently commercial free. There are no ads. The only possibility to stay this way is for you to please let your friends, your family, and others who may be interested in listening to Jerusalem Unplugged know about this podcast. Let's increase the audience and let's keep the podcast commercial free. Thank you for listening. Until the next one.